This show is sponsored by IdealWorkspace.com, which promotes a healthier way of working through their adjustable standing desk. Check out their latest smart adjustable standing desk at Altizen.com. A L T I Z E N.com. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the podcast dedicated to dissect the pulse of business, technology, and media in Asia. In this episode, I speak to Eva Xiao from Tech in Asia on the phenomenon of bicycle sharing startups in China. We discuss why the bike sharing space has suddenly heated up the major players with their customer acquisition and business models and the backers behind the major players such as Mobike and Offal. Hi, Eva. Hey, Bernard. How are you doing? Pretty well. Happy International Women's Day. Yes, happy International Women's Day. And just as a short note, one of the key aspiring goals of Analyze Asia podcast is to have 50-50% representation of men and women on the show. I did that as like my first target when I first started the podcast. How's that going? I'm still stuck at 17.30. Okay. But recently, I managed to get, I think, five women episodes in a row. Okay, so... Still there, still there. And I really hope that all the aspiring women thought leaders, industry leaders in Asia come onto my show. And I'm always looking forward to speak to you. Cool. So I guess we'll get started. Yeah. And I'm talking to Eva Xiao, China reporter in tech in Asia. So since our last conversation about Musical.ly, what have you been up to? Actually, I've been on vacation for a little bit. So I went to the U.S. for three weeks. Most of my close family members are in the U.S. still. So went to the U.S., kind of hung out for two weeks. Then I had one week in San Francisco, Oakland, so the Bay Area. That was kind of interesting to see Chinese companies in Silicon Valley and also talk to some investors who watch China, but from California. Interesting, because the influence of the Chinese internet companies in Silicon Valley is very underreported from what I understand when I was there as well. So it's quite interesting. I guess being based in China, you kind of feel like, and I suppose people in Silicon Valley feel this way too, you feel like China is the center of the world. And then you get to Silicon Valley. And I think that even though, you know, more Chinese companies have a presence there, people who watch China know about China, obviously, but outside of that circle, people seem still pretty oblivious about Chinese companies. So I think it was good for me to see that because obviously when you're in China, you feel like everyone or China is so global, Chinese companies are so are doing so well. But yeah, it's good to go to Silicon Valley and see how, you know, people from other countries view China. I find it ironic, but I have a very interesting anecdote. I met Xu Xiaoping in Silicon Valley, not in China, mm. in person. Yeah, you told me. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. The Chinese version of Ron Conway is in Silicon Valley, but the Ron Conway is not in China. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Soon, I think you've recently done some coverage on Chinese content startups, right? Right, so it hasn't been published yet, but I have been looking at some... I mean, it just happens to be all at once, but I've been looking at some content startups. So there's one in Shanghai called Pair Video, and they're quite interesting because the founder, he founded a newspaper, you know, more than a decade ago. And then he founded something called The Paper, which is very famous in China. One of my colleagues when I was at Techno called it The New York Times of China. So he founded The Paper, and then that's digital, right? So I moved from newspaper to digital, then made The Paper into an English version called Six Tone, which maybe some of you readers have heard of. And then he moved into Pair Video, which is very short video news. So about a minute, like each video is about a minute long. So kind of interesting to watch this serial entrepreneur kind of go through the different phases of media. And then I talked to Billy Billy. So it's a pretty famous live streaming, but also video streaming site. And they also consider themselves like what they call ACG community. So I think it's anime, uh, comics, gaming. Wow, that's interesting. On this kind of Chinese content startups, what are the interesting things that you're actually looking about them? Is it more on their business models or how they are actually acquiring users then? I think for Pair Video and Billy Billy, it's two different things. So Pair Video, what was interesting to me is how they can pull together so much content. So they put out five, about 500 videos a day. So their model of doing that is quite interesting. And then for Billy Billy, it's about looking at their community members. So I was... So they have about 100 million users that are considered like, I guess, youth members. So they might be middle school or high school, even elementary school students. So kind of looking at how they've been able to attract uh, kind of the younger generation in China. That's interesting. So I want to come to the main topic of the day. It's about bike sharing in China. And there seems to be a big hit 
going on with hearing the amazing fundraising rounds of <laughs> Mobike and Awful. But before that, I want to start off with a little bit of understanding. Can you give a brief introduction to the phenomenon of bicycle sharing in China? Sure. So bike sharing is actually, as a lot of readers will realize, it's not a very new concept. But I think what makes bike sharing, at least the current iteration of bike sharing in China, interesting is that it's sometimes it's called dockless or stationless bike sharing. So that means that you can park your bike wherever you want and you use an app to find what bike is closest to you. So you can rent the bike that is closest to you and then you can drop it wherever. And so they have, I guess, two main models of doing this. So one, which is popularized by Mobike, is each bike has uh, QR codes on it. So I'll pick the closest bike to me and then I'll find it, match the number to make sure it's the right bike. And then after I scan the QR code on the bike, it unlocks it and then I can start riding. And then the second method is it doesn't use a QR code, but it's a physical lock. And that's been popularized by OFO. And so Mobiker and OFO are the two, I guess, main horses in, the, in this race. And OFO's method is that it will let you rent the bike through the app, but then it will give you like a four number combination lock. And that's the lock they use to unlock the bike. So a bit different, I guess, the important thing to know about these two systems is that OFO will track the user's phone movements via GPS, whereas the Mobike actually will track the movement of their bikes. A bit technical, but yeah, those are the two different yeah, methods I've seen. That's interesting. Even their methodologies of approaching bicycle sharing is very different. So how does the normal consumer in China actually access the service then? So I've seen three entry points, I suppose. So one, like I said, is smartphone app. So you would scan the QR code and pay through the app. And then there's also WeChat official accounts. So in that case, I think Ofo has an official account. Quick way to summarize it is it's a brand account on WeChat which is a Chinese social messaging app with it's very popular over 800 million monthly active users. So that's one way that they can also rent bikes. And the third is pretty new. WeChat rolled out something called mini programs. I guess a short way to describe mini programs is they're embedded apps within WeChat and you don't have to install or download them. So Mobike recently created a mini program that you can use to scan QR codes and rent bikes. So that's three, the official account, WeChat mini program, and of course, you know, smartphone app. I thought I should just ask a follow-up question here. Recently, I think I remember reading an article in Tech in Asia about the mini programs is not getting enough adoption. So for something like a bicycle sharing app, because it's so location-centric, wouldn't it be the best use case for a mini app or mini program for WeChat? Yeah, actually, you know, when talking to a few people, it looks like the Mobike mini program seemed to be something that people actually preferred over the smartphone app. So in that the article that I wrote, I looked at a report that kind of said, I think it said about 11% of users, so a very small percentage, will continue using a mini program over an equivalent app. But I think for Mobike, it's a good case against that because, you know, if you have it in WeChat, then you don't need to download a smartphone app. So I think Mobite's a pretty strong case for many programs. But yeah, I think it's such a new and early feature that outside of Mobike, I haven't seen any other really compelling or popular cases yet. I have a question then. What is actually the business model that drives these bicycle sharing apps then? It's a big question. There's a lot of speculation around that because it's so cheap to rent the bikes, less than a dollar per half hour. And recently, a lot of companies have been rolling out deals to get more users. So like riding bikes or renting the bikes on the weekend is free. That's pretty incredible, right? The business model that a lot of people have discussed is it looks at the deposits that you pay. For example, with Mobike, you have to pay 299 RMB or about 43 US dollars as a deposit whenever you open an account. So you can't rent without paying this deposit. And so people speculate that this, these deposits can be used to make investments or even accrue interest. And maybe the, the companies will make money off of that. Recently, Mobike is working with China Merchants Bank to have them kind of deal and handle all the deposits from their users. So it's very likely that this theory about them using deposits to make money is true. I would just add that recently I was reading an article on Taixin Global, which is the English version of Taixin, uh, Chinese media. And it said that according to CCTV, Mobike said it collected 900 million yuan, so that's about 130 US dollars, in deposits in the city of Guangzhou alone. So you can imagine if you collect, you know, 3% interest on top of that, or, you know, if they invest that money, 
then they could actually make millions of RMB from the user deposits and not really have to care about the price of renting out the bikes. So it's pretty interesting. But then what about other costs that's involved in the business model? For example, the bike, the bicycles themselves, the logistics in order to get the bicycles arranged and move around and also the user behavior. I mean, most, most commonly, the first question they ask me, what if someone vandalized or steal the bike? How do these things factor into the business model then? Yeah, so a lot of people have doubts about bike sharing and it's viability because of all these challenges. So obviously, in order to roll out, you know, tens of thousands of bikes in each city, they have to pay for these bikes. And I've seen people kind of estimate or say that these bikes are like a couple thousand, maybe 1000 RMB. So obviously, there's the bike hardware. And the logistics, like you mentioned, if you are, say, so I'm based in Shanghai, and I do see big trucks kind of moving or unloading OFO bikes or Mobo bike bikes, or sometimes you'll come across like a stretch of bikes that are very neatly arranged, so obviously not like naturally put that way from users. And that makes sense, because I, I think like, you know, bikes, they probably want to move bikes towards subway or metro stations. They want to arrange them in like the most popular areas, but it might not naturally end up that way. So I think there's quite a bit of logistical work and managing bike location. And then with vandalism and theft, also stealing, right? So, I mean, you see this everywhere, like people taking bikes into very hidden corners of, you know, their neighborhood. One of my friends said he found a bike on the 15th floor, like stuff like that, where clearly these bikes are not being shared properly. And I think that's just a cost that the bike sharing companies have to count into the business model. And recently I saw this fascinating article about like bike hunters. So Mobike having like a special squad of people that are supposed to locate lost bikes. And like one guy finding a bike that was buried underground, like in the dirt. So, I mean, it's pretty extreme, like what people do to these bikes in addition to like scratching off QR codes locking their own personal lock over the bike and stuff like that. That's interesting. And given the business model is almost like a transportation company behaving actually as a finance company. Yeah. If they're actually investing the user deposits then. Yeah. So another thing I would mention in terms of the costs and challenges is that because so many bike companies are competing to acquire users in different cities, some city governments are kind of struggling to deal with these thousands of bikes. A few weeks ago, there's this picture of like kind of a rainbow of bikes that were seized, I believe, by the Shanghai government. I don't know if you saw that around on Twitter, like going around on t Twitter, but a lot of city governments are kind of, I mean, it's similar to ride hailing, right? Like trying to figure out the best way to manage um, this new business. We will take an advertisement break for the moment. Innovation and value generation remained at the forefront of the fourth edition of the IoT Asia Conference, which returns on the 29th to 30th of March at the Singapore Expo Exhibition Halls. Join the three-track conference to learn about the latest developments and initiatives from top leaders and leading lights in the field. Use the code IOT7AASIA to get a 10% discount off the conference rates except academic. Coming back. So why has the bicycle sharing phenomenon in China suddenly exploded? What are the causes of that? From my perspective, at least like a few reasons or characteristics that make it really work well in China. I mean, if you look from like the demand side, this last mile transport is really appealing to a lot of end consumers, especially following the end of the ride hailing craze. So this last mile might be going from a subway, you know, maybe even just a thousand meters, right? So going from a metro stop to your final destination. That's why these are roll being rolled out in first tier cities, some second tier cities. And actually, OFA started off with college campuses. So I think like the last mile transport part, it's definitely answering that need. And then I think something else is that China already has a very robust offline to offline infrastructure. So by that, I mean like QR codes, mobile payments. Um, if that didn't exist, it'd be a lot different. Like with Mobike, it's very convenient. I just scan it. I use, there's already this established user behavior of like scanning QR code to do some action. And then the mobile payments as well. It's all there, like Alipay, WeChat Pay. So I think that's also really important. And then as is very common in China, these companies are so popular because they do crazy price gouging. Like I said, Mobike and Ofo is free now on the weekends. Perhaps there are other bike companies that are also making it free on the weekends. It's less than a dollar per half hour to rent. So I think like the price perhaps is unsustainable. It's very similar to like the early days of ride hailing. I remember getting rides for free, you know, af after the subsidies added up, it was really just zero RMB for a ride. I don't know if that'll go away eventually, but that's definitely something that helps get people 
you know, renting bikes. On top of that, I guess the comparison to Riley hailing, I would just say that in China's tech industry, there's a very common phenomenon, which is like a boom and bust cycle. So once there's like one or two players, a bunch of people will pop up and investors as well. Sort of, I don't want to say mob mentality, that sounds really, really negative, but it's very common, like with ride hailing, there's tons and tons of players and then all at once, a bunch of investors like throwing in their money because they don't want to be left out, sort of. That's how it feels. So in bike sharing, it's the same. Like now there's tons. So this kind of explosion of new industry, it's, it happens a lot in China. I suspect something similar to happen, which is, you know, give or take a year, it'll really be whittled down just a few, a few players and the regulations will start rolling in. So anyway, I think this is just a very typical cycle in China's tech industry. Interesting. It sounds almost like having a Silicon Valley boom and bust plus FOMO fear of missing out <laughs> yes. on steroids in China because the population is three times that amount but is in the billions regime. I want to ask this question. What are the major bicycle sharing startups that have shown up and how are they different from each other? I know you mentioned about Mobike and Ofo. So there's also some other players like Xiaomi Dantua, and then there's like Blue Go Go. There's also something called a Hundred Bike, and I've seen U Bike, Tibay. There's a lot of different players now. Mobike and Ofo get a lot of press because they've raised the most money. And if ride hailing or O to O food delivery has taught us anything, that really matters, right? In terms of quote unquote like winning the market. In terms of differences, I would say. And user experience with prices, really, they're all very, very cheap, right? So if it's just one RMB for half an hour, it's, you know, how how can you, you can't really compete on such a low scale for the price, right? And in experience, some people prefer QR code scanning, but other people say like the OFO, the combination lock is easier. People say that's easier to steal. Obviously, that's not like a good differentiating factor. But I would say at the moment, The services are not drastically different. In that case, you know, I can make another comparison to ride hailing. Like, you know, I guess you could argue that when you get an Uber versus getting Didi Chusing before, you know, they merged, you could say like, oh, I like the service better. But really, you know, if you want to ride, it's the same thing. You know, if it's cheaper, you'll go with one. With the bike sharing, in this case, they're all really cheap. It might just be which one you downloaded first, because remember, you have to do that deposit. So I would say like in terms outside of like the the rental prices, some people prefer OFO because you only have to put down a 99 RMB or about a $15 deposit, whereas Mobike, it's like $43, right? Or roughly that amount. So I mean, like from my perspective or what I've seen, there's not that much differentiation, maybe in terms of availability. So Mobike and OFO have rolled out tens of thousands of bikes. So if I go out in the street and I look for a nearby bike, It's not going to be that far of a walk. If you're a smaller company, you don't have that kind of coverage. It might be more inconvenient. So I guess that's like those are the the big differentiating points. So essentially, you might just become a mobile and awful world and with the rest all got acquired in the end. Or they just die out. You know, like I don't if you're really small and you can't get the coverage of a bigger company, you don't have as deep pocketed investors, you can't afford to keep running these promotions then I think you'll just disappear. You know, like all the, I'm sure there are many, many ride hailing companies that, you know, we've never heard of because maybe they're just very local or just never even got to that point, you know. So how does the bike sharing platforms acquire their users? Is it mainly all through WeChat? I think in terms of like getting new users, I've seen different methods. So one is through WeChat, but a lot of it is just visual. So when you're walking down the street, you know, there's word of mouth and some of that is a lot through WeChat. I've seen a lot of my friends post about it, right? And But I haven't really subscribed to their official accounts. So I don't really get like anything from the companies themselves per se. So a lot of it is word of mouth. But I think like a big thing is just offline presence. And that is like a big thing to acquiring users. I've even seen billboards like Ofo did some crazy billboard campaigning in Shanghai. So a lot of it is really pretty straightforward like that. So did they put the big QR code onto the billboard itself? They have that, but they had, so the billboard campaign, it was like, it showed different people on bikes and then like exhausted coworkers, not on bikes, like walking, you know, like, oh, look at those losers. They're like, they have to walk and you can bike. Or there's another one where it would show people stuck in traffic and then like a happy person on OFA, like biking past the, the traffic jam. So like very simple stuff like that. 
it is true though. I mean, like you can, if you bike, you can avoid traffic jams and you don't have to like walk a kilometer in heels, right? You can just bike. So, but they ran these big billboard campaigns in the Metro. I remember seeing it when I was taking the subway. So yeah, not anything like super clever digital marketing or anything like that. You just see them, you know, out in the street. So you're not tempted to take on a bicycle after you walk out of the transit? You know, so I have an electric scooter and I have still taken bikes. So sometimes I'm really lazy in it. If I have to walk like 800 meters or more after getting off the metro, I'll just just get a Mo bike, you know, or just get a, one of these bikes, right? Or even on the weekend, because they have this free weekend promotion, if it's nice weather, I'll bike around Shanghai because it's really nice. And it's free. So what's the coverage of the bicycle startups in China? I mean, have they engulfed the whole of China, like taking on from first tier to six tier cities and started expanding elsewhere? I recently heard and seen the Mobike's general manager in Singapore now. So, but I haven't seen a single Mobike showing up anywhere close to where I work or live. So yeah, in terms of China, I don't think like very rural places or even small cities have them. I think like for sure they will start off with bigger major cities. But outside of China, you know, like you said, Mobike is expanded to uh, Singapore, so is Ofo. And actually, I, when I was in California, I saw Blue Go Go. So that's a Shenzhen based bike sharing startup. I was really surprised that they were in the US. However, and you can search for this later, the San Francisco city government is really not happy with bike sharing. So they really put their foot down. There's like this great article where I guess officials from the city government clearly and explicitly said that they did not want these bikes here because they would fall on the street, they would crowd the sidewalks, they would be dangerous. You know, that those are concerns that Chinese uh, government officials are facing too. So I actually did try to download and try to rent a Blue Go-Go bike, but, and I did find them, but they were kind of, they were in like an empty parking space in a parking lot. So it looked very unofficial, you know? And I think part of that is because they've, they've been facing resistance from the local city government. I don't know how that will go in the U.S. And then lately, um, someone sent me a picture of an OFO bike in a U.S. college campus. So, I mean, that's kind of OFO's strategy is they start with a college campus. That's what they did in China. And then they move out to, to cities or to the rest of the city, I guess. So I think right now it's mainly China. So I have this question. Who are the key investors to the bicycle sharing companies? And this, the follow-up question is, are there any BAT influence within the bike sharing space? Yeah, as you can imagine, it's very hot industry. So there are very big investors on both sides. Again, I'll just focus on OFO and Mobike. So for OFO, I guess one of the most notable and key investors is DD Chuxing. So that's of course, like the ride hailing app, DD. And then I guess other notable ones I would mention is Xiaomi. So last year, one of their press releases, OFA said that Xiaomi would help them kind of improve the hardware of their bike. Not sure to this point, I'm not sure what the involvement has been exactly, but Xiaomi is one of their investors. And then I guess DST and Yuri Milner. And OFA recently raised, I believe, $450 million. Yeah, I think total funding between OFA and my bike is almost... A billion at this point, which is pretty crazy. And then on Mobike side, there's Tencent, so that's BAT, right? Sequoia Capital, Foxconn, Temasek. My question is, does bicycle sharing actually have an impact to the right sharing companies such as DD? So I think it's going to be more of a partnership. Like with OFO and DD, again, a while back, I think last year, uh, OFO said that it might be integrated into DD's app. So I think it'll be more of a partnership as both are doing transportation, right? So that could be a possibility. And then going back to your question about BAT influence, I think with Tencent, you can hail a ride with DD through WeChat. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that. I mean, already, you know, WeChat, there are many different ways you can get a bike, whether it's through an official account or mini program. But I think that'll definitely have an influence on how people rent or how people encounter like bike sharing different bike sharing apps but in terms of like ride sharing companies i don't think it'll be any kind of competitor i see it more as like partnerships or yeah something like that just before the last question where do you see the bicycle sharing applications go in the next one year or so so (laughs) i suppose if i had a really good prediction then I should invest and make a lot of money. But I guess from my perspective, if it follows the same arc as the different sort of boom and bust iterations before it, so ride hailing and O2O, 
I think it, either Mobike or Ofo, like I think one of them will kind of come out as being at the top of the market. And then I think, so the thing about these transportation startups is that they're really sensitive to local regulations, right? Like with DD, we, we can see that recently the Chinese government rolled out some regulations about their drivers, like having to have like a local a hukou. So that means they have to, you know, be from Shanghai or Beijing. And obviously a lot of drivers are migrant workers or don't have a hukou in Shanghai or Beijing. And that really affects Didi's workforce, right? So I think they had some other regulations too on the type of cars that could be driven, such and such stuff. So that obviously has a big impact on this business. And I think with bike sharing, something to watch out for is how Chinese cities will regulate, maybe to different degrees, how they deal with kind of this wave or this flood of new bikes that are now in their cities. And then also this morning, I was, as you know, like the National People's Congress is happening, it kicked off this weekend. And there was this article, I want to say on Xinhua, or I think like local Chinese media was talking about one of the, the deputies that spoke or wrote to uh, during the Congress was saying that brought up bike sharing is something for people, for local governments to focus on and create regulations for. Actually, it was very positive. I think it was a bus driver who wrote this saying that bikes are environmentally friendly and very positive for cities, but that local governments really have to wrangle all these bikes and figure out a good way to regulate them. So I think that's something to, to watch out for because that would definitely have a big impact on the industry. So it remains to be seen. And of course, we will have a continuing check on this. Eva, it's always good to get you on the show. How do my audience find you? So my Twitter handle is Eva W. Xiao. You can also find my articles on Tech in Asia. You can find me at bleongcw at bernaleong.com. Subscribe to us at Analyze Asia, A-N-A-L-Y-S-E Asia in Twitter. You can drop us a note via Twitter or recommend us on Overcast or give us a five-star rating on iTunes. Of course, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Acast, and tune in. Of course, Google Play in the US market. So once again, Eva, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, Bernard.